We left last week with Mao returning from the Kremlin after just suffering a PR defeat with the 100 Flowers campaign. Having given the green light for criticism, he got more than he bargained for and his image had been tarnished. But after meeting with the new Soviet boss Nikita Khrushchev, Mao returned intent on creating a future of Chinese communism rather than just following the Soviet model. Yes, the Soviet experts sent by Stalin had helped the Chinese achieve some growth, but they weren't anything near a superpower. However, in the same way that the Soviets industrialized in the 30s, Mao needed to bring China into modernity with one swift hit. It was time for a great leap forward. Okay, so the Great Leap Forward can be a pretty divisive topic that's often twisted to meet people's existing political persuasions. Depending on the subreddit that you go on, it's either Mao's ruthless slaughter of up to 45 million Chinese peasants, or on the other hand, a complete defense of Mao's actions. And by the end of this video, I'd be curious to know your verdict. Just how much of the blame can really be put on Mao for the Great Famine of the late 50s and the early 60s? As always, you can support our work on Patreon or for free by liking and subscribing. And so a historian that I often quote on this channel, Jonathan Femby, simply said this about the Great Leap Forward. Over time, the leap became more of a vision than a program. And I think that's an apt place to start. So Zhou Enlai and Chen Yun, who were in Mao's inner circle, were advocates of steady and balanced growth, but Mao didn't want to wait any longer. It had been nearly 10 years since victory in the Civil War, and in the day-to-day -day of governance, he felt that no real revolution had happened. At the same time, Russia was diverting resources to Eastern Europe rather than to Asia, and so there was a gap to become the new leaders of the communist world in Asia. So China set themselves the target of surpassing Britain's economy within 15 years, and during a session of Congress in May of 1958, the Great Leap Forward was approved. Rural peasants were to be transported to the cities to increase industrial output, and immediately, the party got to work on bringing about the revolution by conscripting labor for a vast irrigation scheme. With the excitement high, ministers and provincial bosses were bidding against each other as to who could have the highest industrial and agricultural output, with the more realistic ones being sidelined. Huge communes were also set up on a trial basis in northeastern Manchuria and Henan to pull resources, and by the end of 1958, 25,000 communes were established, each with 5,000 households. There were even visions of the communes becoming mini cities with universities and hospitals, and the Jiwu commune in Henan had 130,000 people in it. If you don't know how a commune works, think of it as boarding school. You don't own private property, but belong to the commune. You don't own food, but eat from the commune's canteen during meal times, and you don't own the farming equipment, but rather use the commune's equipment provided for you. In 1958, China actually went through a bumper harvest, and so Mao instructed the canteens to be serving five meals a day. Because of his advocacy for a steady revolution, Zhou Enlai was replaced by Chen Yi as foreign minister. Mao could have no interference with this great leap, and at a conference at Chengdu, Mao said that right now one day is equivalent to 20 years, and that in 1958 alone, farm production was to increase by 17-20%. to Mao's long desired revolution was now finally underway. So I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of 20th century China. They hadn't had the centuries of enlightenment thinking and the scientific revolution that the West had had. Sure, eastern cities had had heavy interaction with Europe, but in a lot of respects, the rural center of China remained somewhat in the Middle Ages. It's also worth noting that Mao wasn't exactly an agricultural scientist, so as ridiculous as some of these policies are about to seem, it is important to recognize that up until the 21st century, the timeline of modernity in China ran behind that of the West. So Mao's central policy that the leap is often remembered for was the use of backyard furnaces. Essentially, 750,000 backyard furnaces were set up to smelt iron and steel from anything from pots, pans, bikes, doorknobs, or even scissors. By the end of 1958, 100 million people were working these furnaces with the aim of drastically increasing steel production. Secondly, and this is no joke, peasants were mobilized into squadrons to conduct offensives against sparrows. Children as young as five were recruited into the anti-sparrow offensives, with other pests like rats, flies and mosquitoes also being targeted. Peasants were to bang pots and pans to scare the sparrows away, or to kill them with a slingshot. The theory was that this would protect the crops. In the far west, communes were also set up to replace the nomadic lifestyles of Turkic Muslims, and they launched campaigns against Islam, independence, and Soviet influence. You can watch these videos here to see how the Soviets always had a strong presence in western Xinjiang. At the same time, the theory was that anything the Soviets did, China could do better. 
and so they made Tiananmen Square to be bigger than the Soviet Red Square. Mao also advocated for new farming practices too. As the name would suggest, deep ploughing involved farmers planting the seed deeper into the soil because it was believed that that was where richer soil was, while at the same time close cropping involved the plants being planted more tightly against each other to prevent vermin infestation. And so with all these policies propelling the leap into motion, the time to overtake Britain economically was cut from 15 years, to 7 years, to 5 years, to just 2 years. The vision had become truly divorced from reality. So it goes without saying that the Great Leap was a huge disaster, but it is important to also address the natural factors behind the Great Famine. Firstly, the Yellow River burst in 1959, and with this destroying much acreage, an estimated 2 million people died as a result. Secondly, there was a locust plague in Henan which wiped out further acreage, and so with already scant harvesting yields, China couldn't afford to lose any more grain. But unfortunately, the party's policies would also prove to be extremely decisive. Firstly, the backyard furnaces created low quality steel that couldn't be used, but these were also expensive to fund and so China printed more money which led to really bad inflation. Secondly, the long hours of the leap required led to exhaustion based deaths, particularly when in conjunction with no food in the early 60s. The exhaustion also resulted in heavy workplace accidents, with many in the factories dying from easily preventable incidents. As grain yields started to shrink, shock battalions were sent to the farm, but these were less effective than the absent peasants who were in the urban factories. If China was a sporting team, then everyone was playing out of position. At the same time, the policies proved contradictory and ineffective. Pots were needed to be melted for steel, but were to also be used to scare sparrows. And deep plowing didn't access the more fertile soil, but instead killed the crop, as did close cropping. Not only that, but the cadres leading the communes would massively bloat their output numbers. For instance, it was common practice for communes to borrow pigs from other communes when inspectors came. Cadres would also collect grain from large plots of land and claim that it had actually come from only a small plot. Now don't worry kids, your father's still gonna put food on this table, just not as much, so it might get a little competitive. <laughs> Lie to us! Uh, I don't know. Hey, where's the other guy? Come on you bastard, I'm late for work! This then really misled the party on grain statistics as Mao boasted of an annual output of 450 million tonnes of grain, when in reality it was closer to 200. With these false statistics, China exported what it thought was excess grain when they really needed to keep it. By April of 1959, it was clear that the Great Leap Forward wasn't going to plan. 25 million people across 5 provinces needed urgent relief or else they'd all starve to death, and a Tibetan uprising in the west saw the Dalai Lama flee to India. In response to this mounting pressure, Mao resigned the state chairmanship. This was a symbolic act more than anything because power was vested in being the chairman of the party rather than the country, but the message was clear, the Great Leap wasn't going well. Have a look at these stats. Grain output shrunk from 185 million tonnes in 1958 to 147.5 in 1961. For context, America's output was 163.5 million tonnes in 1961, with about a quarter of the population and a much more extensive import market. At the same time, industrial output fell from 121 billion yuan in 1958 to 94 billion yuan in 1962. It was clear that China was going backwards and not forwards. So with everything going so wrong, the head of the military, Peng Dehuai, spoke up and he penned a letter to Mao speaking of what he'd seen while touring the country. On the 23rd of July 1959, Mao made what would prove to be a crucial speech where he attacked bourgeois rightists and not so subtle code for Peng for lacking a backbone. Yes, there were few vegetables and no soap, but guys like Peng needed metaphoric sleeping pills to relieve their tension and have faith in the movement. Effectively, Peng had been purged from the party and he resigned as defence minister saying, I will never become a counter-revolutionary, never commit suicide, and I will support myself by the sweat of my brow. Despite retaining his place on the Politburo, he was barred from all future meetings. And we wouldn't be doing the leap justice without talking about the human cost with no food available. Between 1958 and 1960, the rural death rate rose from 11.07 deaths per 1,000 to 28.68 per 1,000. People ate tree bark and stones and some even turned to cannibalism. Workers would conserve what little energy they had, only worsening the famine as the farms weren't being manned. The general consensus is that about 30 million Chinese died from the famine. Mao would put everything on this leap working, but it didn't, and in 1962 he had to call it off with his tail between his legs. With the Hundred Flowers campaign and now this, Mao had experienced back-to-back -back defeats, and he had no choice but to take himself out of the public eye. 
As other people within the party began to undo his revolution, Mao would have no choice but to make one final bid to regain power, the Cultural Revolution. Thanks for watching, we'll look at the Cultural Revolution in two episodes time because next week we're going to look at the Sino-Soviet split that was happening at the same time. Don't forget to let me know below how much of the famine can be directly attributed to Mao himself. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.